Right, I'm going to do this from up here because I need this screen. I have changed this talk so many times you wouldn't believe it. It started out as a half an hour talk and then it became an hour and a half talk and then it became an hour's talk, so I'm not quite sure where I am. So this is going to help me follow where, I, where I'm going to be. Um, I suppose I'm going to change tax a little bit and instead of looking at it from that big picture view, I want to I narrow it back down again and talk research. Whenever I get the chance, you know that that's my passion. It's what I really want to uh, be here and share with you. So I want to talk about the complexity of the spine and the nervous system and what it is that our brain does all day, every day, and how this impacts the way we move, the way we function, and what it is that spinal dysfunction does to our system and what it is that we probably do when we adjust these dysfunctional segments in the spine. It's been an incredible weekend for me. And one of the reasons for that is that I've had both my worlds collide, basically, this, this weekend, the, the clinical world with you guys, but also the research world. I've, I've been joined by some uh, really esteemed top, top world-leading research scientists and professors, and we had a research session that we put on on Friday. And it was really incredible because not only were we there to present to those that were able and lucky enough to be there to listen to it, but we've also spent two days together discussing the research. What, what is the research? What does it say? Where are the gaps? What do we still need to do? And literally mapped out all the incredible amount of work that we still need to do. So my mind is like all over the place. So if I'm a tiny bit scattered, it's because there has been so much crammed into this weekend that I hardly know whether I'm coming or going. I'm not even sure I've eaten all that much this week, and I kind of forgot. There was just too much uh, science information that's, that's come along the way. So what I wanted to do this morning is just share with you a little bit of the, the research session for those of you who couldn't be there, and, and talk a little bit about what it is that we discussed as a team uh, on stage there, uh, the research that we know about the neurophysiological mechanisms of chiropractic care. Because although we talk about you know, holism being fantastic and reductionism, some people will say is not so fantastic. Remember that that reductionist scientific world is my world. So if you're slagging off reductionism or reductionistic science, you're slagging off the work that I do. So please keep it in mind that it's not really black and white, that there are, there's a time and a place for all these aspects as well, and together they tell the whole story. I may live a holistic life and I might take a holistic approach to healthcare, but to me, that reductionist science is incredibly, incredibly important. And the reason that I dedicated my entire working career to this reductionist science is because it can give us so many answers. You know, we have theories and we have models, but some of the theories that we have are kind of crazy. You recognize that, right? Some of the theories that we've had over the years, they're, they're a little bit nuts. And the only way we're ever going to find that out is if we actually put our models and our theories to the test. And we do that with science. And that's where this reductionist science has a huge role to play for all of us, for us as an entire profession, and for all the public out there that still don't get access to chiropractic care. So I hope you'll uh, enjoy the, the journey. And uh, part of this journey, too, is I need to acknowledge my team. I know I get a lot of credit for the work that I do. And, and for going around the world and presenting this research. But I couldn't do this work if it wasn't for my team back home. And, and the team looks slightly larger than it really is, because it includes about six bioengineering students that we had at the time. And that makes us feel a little bit better. <laughs> We're actually a way smaller team than that, about half that size. And that's the team, the, the dedicated team in New Zealand. I've been lucky enough to have both Dr. Kelly Holt, whom I can see here in the audience, and Dr. Imran khan who I think is somewhere in the audience, but I'm not quite sure where, um, who are here with us this weekend to, to take part in that research panel and to have these discussions with these esteemed professors from around the world about what it is this neural plastic mechanism that we actually have. How does chiropractic care work? What is a subluxation? It's, it's an incredibly unique opportunity. It's literally taken me almost 20 years of my life to learn neuroscience to the level that I've learned it, to learn research methodology to the level that I'm at, to be able to have those conversations with these esteemed professors that have come and, and shared their time with us. You know, I wouldn't be able to, and there's still stuff they talk about that I can't concept yet. It's gonna take me another 10, 20 years you know, if I'm lucky, to ever get round and understand the, the depth and the insights that these guys have to share with us. 
So it's, it's been a, a real privilege, and I'd like to thank the Rubicon Group for that privilege. Because if it wasn't for the Rubicon Group putting on this event and, uh, and allowing me to have this research session, I wouldn't have had that opportunity. So I want to share with the rest of you some of the insights that we gained along the way. But before I do that too, I also want to thank and acknowledge all those people out there that do fund us. Funding for research is the biggest thing that's holding us back. Uh, even a single little study costs about 100,000 US dollars. And that's just a single, little, small, basic science study. If you're talking about larger clinical trials, you can talk about millions of dollars. So the main thing that holds us back in the chiropractic profession today with our science, with being able to understand what a subluxation really is and how our adjustments really work, it's not about expertise anymore. It's, it's not even equipment. It's literally that we do not have the funding to pay people to collect and analyze the data that we need. It's the big stumbling block that we have. And it's incredibly difficult. I tell people that I beg, borrow, and steal to, to, to get the research that I do done. And in some cases, that's true. But I don't quite think we've stolen anything yet, have we, Kelly? I don't think so. Maybe we've nicked a few pens from the office when we're not supposed to. Um, but we really do beg, borrow, and, and not steal, if you know what I mean, to try and get the work done that we have got done. There's not, there's not funding bodies in New Zealand that are super excited about funding complementary and alternative health care. You know, we, we, here in, in America, you, you have actually got some money set aside for that, but in New Zealand, we don't. So the work that we do is, is on a shoestring budget most of the time uh, from a few uh, lovely people, uh, chiropractors, that actually donate to us. There's a few groups. There's these groups that are on there that have, that have given money over the years to, to enable us to do a study or two. And I really want to acknowledge them. We also do try to collaborate with professors like these guys that have come over to spend time with us this weekend. And the reason that we do that is that we don't have time. I'm far too impatient to spend 30, 40 years becoming an expert in more techniques, more research methods. Do you know what I mean? It's taken me 20 years to become somewhat of an expert in techniques like somatosensory evoked potentials and transcranial brain magnetic stimulation. And I don't have the time to learn all these other methods as well as I should to do it properly. And, and that's another thing. It is so important that we do the research properly. This takes years and years and years to get right. It's actually very easy to just fake shit. <laughs> and sadly, people in our profession, they do. Do you realize that? There's people in our profession, they literally make shit up. And then they publish it in their own journal. I could do that too. You know, it wouldn't then take me 10 years to get some of these papers or these studies that we're doing done. It wouldn't take me five years sometimes to get a paper that is finished, published. But sometimes it takes us five years to get that paper published because it, got, it has to go through that proper scientific peer review. And I mean, how many, how many chiropractic neuroscientists do you think there is on the planet? Not that many. And I work with most of them. So we actually have to send it in and get it reviewed by peers that are not chiropractors. So oftentimes our research articles, they're, they're peer reviewed by neurosurgeons who have no concept about chiropractic. So why do I even bother doing that? Because I want you guys to be able to trust that concluding one-liner at the end. Do you know what I mean? I want it to have value. I want it to be worth something. I want it so that you can go and talk to any other medical doctor, any other health professional, any other scientist on the planet, and that conclusion has some weight to it. It's valid. It's true. And us as a profession, we're still very, very good at making claims that we have no evidence to back. And that makes it very, very difficult for me. You know, I'm a scientist, and, and scientists, they usually don't like making and uttering a statement unless they've got three references they can put behind the sentence. Do you know what I mean? And then we have conferences like this, and there, are, there have been a few claims that I've heard <laughs> over the weekend that I'm sitting there thinking, there's no fucking evidence for that at all. <laughs> I'm like, fuck me. <laughs> I have some people here that I <laughs> highly respect. Oh, my God. <clears throat> anyway, 
I'll get back to that, and I'll hustle you a little bit more about that later on. But, but I'm hoping that as a group, as a profession, that we can become a little bit more critical about information, that we think a little bit more about what validity does these, do these statements have, that we're a little bit more careful about what we say and what we claim. Because sometimes taking the conservative route and only really communicating stuff that we can actually back up with scientific evidence, it holds a hell of a lot of weight. And the story that's coming out from the research evidence that we're doing is actually better than some of the claims that chiropractors have claimed for 100 and odd years. That's the amazing, amazing thing. That if we actually take the time to look at the science that we do have that is coming out, if we make an effort as a group, as a team, to, to make scientific research a strategic priority for us, we will end up with so much incredible backing for what it is that we do, so much proof for the effects that we have, that, that I think there's nothing else on earth that is going to enable the public to come and see us and for us to provide even better care than, than if we do and conduct and publish really good, solid scientific evidence. I cannot overstate that enough. But I'll, I'll, I'll jump into it. And I'm far more serious than I normally am, and I uh, do apologize for that. That's not meant to be there quite yet. So I've literally spent almost 20 years of my life, and I am, have no intentions of stopping yet, um, publishing studies, painfully publishing studies. Some of these articles, you know, it looks like, yay, cool study, we get some, you know, Facebook traction for about a day and a half, uh, maybe a week if we're lucky, you know, and it, and it would have taken me 10 years of my life, <laughs> 10 years of painstakingly difficult, complex work. Some of the analysis that I had to do, we laughed about it in the research session, like these some of the sensory evoked potentials that uh, my colleague Kelly Holt kindly called squiggles. Uh, I had to look at these squiggles day in and day out for about seven months to analyze one single study. Seven months, all day, every day, looking at these squiggles, moving my cursors to be able to pick those peaks. It's another reason that we work with these bioengineers. They literally are w worth their weight in gold. Imran now writes me a program, hits a few buttons and spits it all out. The beauty of it for my sake is I now know I can, I can sleep and dream seps, okay? I can see a sep peak and I know, if, I know what it is and I know where it is and I know what it's come from and, you know, I can see them now. Whereas if you just had to just click a few buttons and spit it all out, you wouldn't be able to see it in the same way. So it has value, I, I get that. But these articles that we've, I've, I think I've, I'm up to about 45 publications at the moment and that's over 18 years. <laughs> But it's not even about the numbers. To me, what's the most important is the quality. And the quality of my own research, I'm my own biggest critic. And, and part of the story that I'll tell you when I'm sharing the research that we have done is the story that, that, that has evolved as I go along. So we found one thing and, I, you know, and I'd go, well, okay, so what? You know, what does that mean? You know, what other methods are there out there that could look at that at a deeper level or from a different aspect? Or you know, just because this one study shows one thing, how do I know that for sure? How can I double and triple and quadruple check that that actually is the case, that we do make people stronger? Do we make people stronger? How can I be absolutely sure? So we'd do another study or we'd do another study. We'd, we'd find some other expert with some other technique to validate validate what it is that we found. A real scientist will never be happy, never be satisfied with what they've done because they'll still want to explore it more and more and more and more. And although we've come up with this um, really, really interesting picture of how chiropractic care works, I still think there are a lot of other ways out there that it still might work as well. So the reason that I wrote the book, The Reality Check, that you can, by the way, download for free, uh, that has been out there the entire time, I'm not trying to sell you the book, but I think it's so, so important. If you haven't read this book yet, please do. It was actually not written for the public. I know it's, it's, it's espoused to be written for the public. Who do you think I actually wrote it for? Chiropractors, I wrote it for you guys. Because I needed you guys to understand what it is that we're doing. I needed you to understand the implications that this has for us as a profession the implications that this has for how we communicate what chiropractic is and what our care does to the human body. 
because it's not relieving pressure off squashed nerves. I used to go around and sort of very apologetically say, you know, please, maybe we could, you know, maybe please stop talking about the squash nerve theory, you know, please, please. Um, but I've kind of stopped doing that now, and I've almost, actually not almost, I outright say, you know, we need to fucking stop talking about the squash nerve theory. We don't really have any evidence that relieving pressure off a nerve root makes people feel and function better, unless you've got radiating nerve root pain. And the actual story that's coming about from the, the research that we're doing is bigger than relieving pressure off a squashed nerve root. You know, Aristotle and these, you know, great thinkers of the past, they actually got a few things wrong as well. Did you know that? They actually got a few things wrong. Just because our forefathers got a few things wrong as well doesn't mean that they were idiots. Do you know what I'm saying? They were amazing geniuses of their time. And they try to come up with explanations that fit the science at the time. But time has moved on, and so has the science. And this neural plasticity model that I talk about all over the world now, I didn't make that up. There are neuroscientists that have been working on this for 40, 50 years. The evidence is incredibly solid with this neural plastic model. Can you have squashed nerve roots? Absolutely. Can you have tissue damage when you've got low back pain? Hell yeah. But a lot of cases, a lot of people that come and see us every single day that we find and adjust subluxations in, they don't have squash nerve roots. Chances are that most of them don't have squash nerve roots. But I'll pretty much guarantee you that every single person, every single person's spine that you adjust, you will have a neural plastic effect on their brain. And that's why it's so important that we understand this. And I'm not slagging BJ off. You know, it was kind of cool, you know, it was a fantastic model, and it served us very well for the time that it was appropriate. But now that we have answers through science to an even bigger and better story, then we need to make that change as well. It takes a little bit of effort from our side, but it's so important. If we go out there and talk about relieving pressure off squashed nerve roots, we will be laughed at. We will be ridiculed. If we can go out there and talk about the fact that chiropractic care has this neural plastic effect on the brain, it seems to make the brain more accurately aware of what's going on inside our bodies and the world around us, and therefore integrate that information more efficiently, more effectively, more accurately, and therefore respond more appropriately and control our whole system in a better way. It explains why we can impact pretty much anything in the human body, because everything else is connected to the brain, yeah? It's not just relieving pressure of one single squash nerve root. And this has big implications for us. And this has big implications for us to discuss our techniques, to discuss the mechanisms, to discuss how do we take care of people, who do we take care of, how do we take care of them to the best of our ability. It's also why we need to do so much more research, because we literally have only scratched the surface of what we actually need to do to be able to fully explain what it is that's going on. So let me take you quickly through what it is that we looked at. Um, okay, but before I do this, <laughs> this is my change slide uh, uh, in three times already. What are the benefits of science? Can you guys think of any benefits of science, of, of, the, of the work that we do? We can actually figure out what's actually working, right? It's really cool that we come up with theories and ideas, and I, and I, I take my hat off to these scholars, the, the philosophers out there, you know, like David Koch. He does an incredible job at thinking these concepts and coming up with these ideas and these thoughts and these theories, amongst many, you know, obviously right the way from Dee Dee Palmer. The thoughts and the theories are incredibly important. But what we can do with science is we can actually figure out we can put these models to the test and we can figure out which theories and which models are actually true and to what degree, right? That is, that is really, really important. We can also discover new theories. So new ideas can come about because of the research evidence that we come up with. If you really think about every single study that we do, it's like one little puzzle piece. And if we were, uh, were to understand everything in the, in th that was ever to be understood about chiropractic, we would really probably need like three billion puzzle pieces. And they all fit beautifully together, and they create this massive big puzzle picture. 
So the theories and the models that we come up with is like the cardboard box. Do you remember the days with cardboard box and puzzles? I now play puzzles on my phone, but do you remember those days when we had little cardboard boxes? And on the cardboard box, you've actually got the picture that you're trying to make? Are you with me? Yeah, so what scientists or even philosophers do is they try to think up, what is that puzzle picture? What does that cardboard box look like when you've only got, say, 300 out of a three billion puzzle piece picture? So if you've only got a few puzzle pieces, you know, you, from there you have to try and then come up with what is that puzzle piece, what does it really look like? What is the truth? But what we as scientists then can do is continue to create really well designed puzzle pieces. Like if I made shit up, do you think that's gonna kind of screw up the puzzle picture a little bit? Are you with me on that, yeah? So we really carefully, carefully controlled, create the puzzle pieces. We make sure, we make double sure and triple sure that that puzzle piece is correct. Sometimes I've literally done a study three times before I've published the finding, just to convince myself that what I was seeing was the truth. You with me? So when you have these puzzle pieces and you make these puzzle pieces, you then are gonna try and fit them all together. Sometimes when you start fitting those puzzle pieces together, they don't actually fit. You know, what do you do in that case? What are you supposed to do? I mean, some people might like to get the sledgehammer out, right? I'm just gonna fucking make that sucker fit, you know, yeah? <laughs> that is an option. But I would recommend against it. What you can do is rethink the cardboard box. Rethink the model. Maybe we got it a little bit wrong. And that's where we're at today. When we started out 20 years ago, looking at this research, you know, I was still thinking, well, you know, we probably relieve a little bit of pressure. There's probably these reflexive effects at the spinal cord level. And some of the early studies we did, you know, it, I mean, it wasn't completely a coincidence, but you know, it's almost like we had two extra channels, let's plonk a couple of EEG electrodes on the brain. And we found no changes in the spinal cord. We found no changes in the brainstem. But these lasting changes happening at the cortical level. It made us have to go and rethink what the hell is going on. What, what is that model? What does it really look like? So the model that we're sharing with you today, the model that Kelly Holt so beautifully talked about on stage yesterday, is based on the last 20 years of research studies. And they've been hard fought for. Blood, sweat, and tears, believe you me. A burnout and a couple of divorces, not just me, you know, just one my end. You know, along the way, you know, a little mental breakdown, you know, shit like that, fun games. So it's, it's, it's cost a lot. It's not an easy job to do. And I know I usually bounce around on stage and I'm really happy and cheerful and positive about it all, but it has been difficult. It's been really difficult along the way. But I still think it is so incredibly important for all those people out there that don't have access to chiropractic care. And through properly conducted, properly published research papers, you know, the demand for what you do will rise. It has to, it has to. We impact that brain in such a profound way, it's incredible. It still gives me goosebumps to think about. Some of the research studies that we found, I still pinch myself. I, I, I couldn't make this shit up. I'm not that smart. It's, it's incredible. It's almost like, you know, innate intelligence or the universal intelligence is literally sharing with us the truth. That's what it feels like sometimes. Because half the time I've predicted an outcome, I don't get what I predict. Scientists don't usually like that. You know, they kind of prefer to be able to find what they predict because otherwise it means you're not as smart as you think you are, you know what I mean? It's not that fun to find that out. But I've actually found it really, really beautiful. And the cool thing, I think, too, for me, is that I actually don't give a shit what the results are. I truly don't care how chiropractic care works. I've seen it. I know it works. I know it works for some people really, really well. So the only thing that's ever driven me is how? How the hell can, it, how the hell can I adjust someone's spine and it affect them so much? That's what drives me. So I don't really care if this study has a positive or a negative outcome. It just might not work that way. Okay, let's move on to the next. Or maybe the, the methods I was using weren't sensitive enough to pick it up. And then you learn something from that and you move on to the next. The, the real gold lies in the billions of puzzle pieces that we build over time. So yes, it's really, really cool that we've done what we've done, that we've got these few studies, and I will continue to go and shout about it from the you know, top of my voice all over the world, because it is really fucking cool. Excuse the French, I'm getting some real swear words coming out. <laughs> a little bit riled up this morning. <sighs> 
But these few studies is really meaningless. It's a drip or a ripple on a big pond. So when I'm talking to these you know, esteemed professors that we've had here this weekend, you know, it's almost an embarrassingly small amount of research that we've done. It really is. And, and the only people that can change that is us, right? Collectively, us. I don't have millions of dollars. I've literally written grants up to $80 million worth. That's what we could start tomorrow if we had the money. That's what we're capable of, that's the connections we have, that's the people that we're connected to, that we can collaborate with. You know, literally a research program of $80 million we could start tomorrow if we just had the funding. All designed, all outlined. I mean, half the studies that we've literally designed and ready to go, we even have ethics for. We could literally start tomorrow. We wouldn't even need to get the ethics, but anyway, I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna to rant too much. So we have many, many theories of, of what a subluxation is and what chiropractic care does over the, over the last 120 odd years. Many, many theories. Some of them are probably a little bit crazy. Uh, some of them not so much. So the one that's becoming very, very clear now is this neural plasticity model. And what we did in our little research session, we had these wonderful, wonderful people come join us uh, and we literally discussed the evidence that exists about how does the spine function in a normal situation? What is normal spinal function? How does the brain control normal healthy spinal function? Right the way through to what happens in chronic pain and everything in between. And then the, the second half of the whole session was all about what is the evidence that we have, we have done over the last 20 years that shows that chiropractic has an effect on the neuromuscular system, that it has this neuroplastic effect. So here on your... Uh, your left is Professor Paul Hodges. Uh, Professor Paul Hodges is probably one of the world's leading scientists when it comes to spinal physiology on the planet, like hands down. Incredible guy. He, he, he sadly started out as a physiotherapist, you know. Damn, imagine if he'd started out as a chiropractor. Anyway, but don't hold that against him. The amount of work that this young man has done is, it just blows me away. It makes me feel incredibly inadequate. The breadth of the research that this guy has done is just incredible. So he shared with us how, what neuroscientists know about how the brain controls spinal function. And I'll, and I'll share some of these insights with you. Beside him here, we've got Kelly Holt. He presented yesterday, and I hope you were lucky enough to hear him. He put together a beautiful presentation. He's been with me since 2006. We actually, we actually studied chiropractic together. He was in the year above me, and he always likes to point that out. <laughs> we have a real, um... anyway, I won't go there. Okay. So... <laughs> So, Dr. Kelly Holt, if it wasn't for Dr. Kelly Holt, I probably wouldn't still be here. His, his incredible sense of humor is, has kept me alive through the tough times, and there's been plenty of them. He's also a brilliant scientist. He did his PhD in clinical research and has run the clinical trial on the older adults. If you've heard me talk about the clinical trial on older adults and the changes in sensory motor function, that was Kelly Holt's work, his PhD studies. And he's been a huge part of the team ever since. Well, right from the beginning, right from when I started as research director in 2006 at the New Zealand College. So it's been like a team of two that's turned into a team of, you know, maybe five or six, you know, a few of them part-timers. Next to Kelly Holt is Dr. Imran Khan Niazi, originally from Pakistan. He's a bioengineer, he's not a chiropractor. And again, this man is worth his weight in gold. It's why I don't have to sit for seven months analyzing these SEP peaks from four channels, because now we're collecting SEP data or EEG data from 64 channels, and we're doing multiple comparisons. So, you know, we're literally talking about two, three, uh, two or three years of m my time if I had to analyze that on my own. Are you with me? Two or three years of my time. Imran, because of his bioengineering skills, has created a program that you can hit a few buttons and spit it all out for me. Oh my God, I love that man. I love that man. He always teases us. He says, you know, his job is to kick us chiropractors out of the, out of the lab so that he can collect good data and he can analyze the good data. <laughs> We're only allowed in to adjust our subjects. But the thing is too, he's only one human being who has three children and a wife that is pulling her hair out because her husband's never there, because we overwork him. One of our other bioengineers that we had uh, been working with us for quite some time, Erasmus, he left us just, just recently, which was really, really sad because he's been a fantastic part of the team for four years. And do you want to know the reason why he left us? He loves us. He thinks we're great. He loves working with us. But we could only pay him enough to live out of someone else's garage. For some strange reason, he would quite like 
Actually, his fiance, his girlfriend, would quite like to not have to live out of someone else's garage any longer. <laughs> so they're going back to Denmark, where even as a PhD student, he is paid almost twice as much as we paid him to work for us. Do you see what I'm saying? So we can twist people's arms for only so long. And we do. We, we literally twist people's arms to do the work that we do. We squeeze every bit of research out of every penny we have to the point where some of our staff have had to live out of someone else's garage. And I suppose that can't go on. For, it's not sustainable. Are you with me in the long run? Like, we almost have to draw a line and say, okay, we can't do this anymore. We're all so overworked and, and knackered and shattered that you know, I don't even dare send the team an email any longer. <laughs> Can you please do this? You know, because I just get so much shit back. You know, no, on top of the 5,000 other things that you've asked me to do, I can't do that, thank you very much. That's the responses that I now get. So I go, okay, okay, that's cool. I'll do it. <laughs> no worries. I'm not looking at you, Kelly, for any particular reason. <laughs> so then, the, then there's obviously me, and beside me is, is my PhD professor. This is Professor Bernadette Murphy. Now, this woman is a chiropractor and a PhD and a neuroscientist and a mother and, 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 and. She still practices to this day. She teaches at a university and does research at a university in Canada, University of Ontario Institute of Technology. And this woman was the first ever chiropractor to do a neuroscientific study about chiropractic, ever. That's incredible. <laughs> So until she did, you know, we've talked about affecting the nervous system. We had talked about affecting the nervous system for 120 years at that stage, but we had no evidence until Bernadette rocked on up to Auckland University and said, hey, I want to do research, and I reckon that we affect the nervous system, and I want to test that out with the H reflex. And that paper was published in 95. Pretty cool. And from then on, she's done more research than any of us. And I still, to this day, collaborate with her. She's an incredible woman, the smartest woman I've ever met and probably will ever meet, uh, and also the most loveliest, humble human being on planet Earth. Uh, it's incredible. It's incredible. I would, uh, there's nothing I wouldn't do for her. The only reason I'm actually a scientist and that I'm doing what I'm doing today is because she bumped into me at Auckland University where I was studying because I just liked it, you know, because that's kind of the crazy person that I am, you know what I mean? And this was after I was a chiropractor. And she talked me into doing research with her. And I said, I'm not smart enough to do that. She goes, oh, hell yes, you are. And I said, no, no, I'm not. She goes, yeah, hell yes, you are. And so that's the only reason that I've done the research that I've done today is because Bernadette talked me into doing research with her. So my only ambition was literally to get my PhD so that I could do proper research, and I wanted to be her research assistant. I was going to practice four days a week, and I was going to donate one day a week, and I was going to be her research assistant. This is an incredible lady. So she was here with us too and presented. And the final gentleman on the right is Professor Kamal Turka. And I can see him at the back of the room. So he is still with us, which is really cool. Now, Kamal's got a real uh, big place in my heart. This, this gentleman is a professor of neuroscience. He's a professor of physiology at Koch University in Istanbul. He spent 30 years in Adelaide. He started out in Scotland. Like, he's a very well-traveled scientist. And he's another one of those real bigwigs in the neurophysiology world. And what this guy's done is literally dedicated 25 plus years of his life to literally look at one research methodology, the way that they, the way neuroscientists interpret EMG data, and basically stood up in front of the entire neuroscience community with this work, saying that the way you've interpreted EMG data for the last 50 years is wrong. Can you imagine the balls that that would take? I've never actually seen his balls, do you know what I mean? But they must be quite big. <laughs> we keep joking about it, eh, Kamal? But, you know, I'm married now, so, you know, it's not going to work. <laughs> but it, that's, that, that takes guts. Imagine standing up in front of people whose entire careers have been using the EMG and interpret it the, it, interpreting it the wrong way in all their papers, and Kamal gets up and basically says, all your research is bullshit. I mean, that's, that's incredible. So I knew from, I knew even before I'd met him that this guy was someone I really wanted to get to know. Whether he would end up working with me or not was kind of by the by, but, but it was, I was driven to, to meet and, and talk to this man. So for three years, I rocked up to every neuroscience conference I could 
to just speak to this man and talk about his research. You know, you know, in, if you're like a movie, uh, you know, fanatic, you know, he's like John Wayne. Do you know what I mean? He's like one of those rock stars in the, in the neuroscience world. So to me, it was like he was one of my biggest gurus. You know, oh my God, this is Kamal Turka. You know what I mean? So I would like rock up to him every single neuroscience conference and go, oh, hey, Kamal, I saw your latest paper. You know, you'd published this, this, and this, and we'd start talking about his research. You know, and it literally took three years. He, he actually found out I was a chiropractor very early on. And he used to tease me, you know, oh, you know, you chiropractors, you just massage them and you make them feel better. <laughs> <clears throat> so yeah, after a little while, he started to, to tease me and say he needed to bring shoulder pads whenever we were going to get together, because I would be punching him every time he teased me about being a chiropractor, and I was just nice to people, and I massaged them, and I made them feel better. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, it took three years, and then he, he finally asked, well, what research do you do? Because this guy doesn't really need to talk about other people's research, do you know what I mean? Like, he does so much research himself, and he's, he's involved in so many different fields that, you know, he certainly doesn't need to talk to a chiropractor what a chiropractor does. But anyway, I started to explain what it is I was doing and why I was you know, so fascinated by his work and some of the findings that we'd had. And he turned around and goes, well, Heidi, we could actually test that. And this is one of those moments in my life where I know exactly where we were, what I was wearing, where we were sitting, what we were eating. You know, you know what I mean? It was one of those moments for me. You know, we were in this little cafe in Denmark. He's forgotten the whole thing, right? And, <laughs> and, and he goes, yeah, 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 we could do that. You know? And he starts drawing on a napkin, explaining you know, what it is and how we could do it. And I've still got that napkin. <laughs> But anyway, okay, so you get that I'm, I really admire this man, yeah? We've ended up doing research together now for, we, we decided it was about seven years, backwards and forwards. One of the first studies that I wanted to do with Kamal is still ongoing. So it's taken seven years, the same study. We've had to go back and forth to, to Turkey to literally collect all the data that we needed, because it's not what we thought it was. It's an incredible study. Other studies we've done are done and dusted in two weeks. So you know, that's, that's the way of research, it's really up and down. But this is the group that we had there. And I'm running short of time, so I'm gonna race through some of the findings. <clears throat> so we started off with Paul, and he talked to us a lot about what is spinal function. The brain has to beautifully coordinate the, the spinal movements. Sometimes we need our spine to move, and sometimes we need our spine to stiffen up. This can be voluntary or involuntary. Like if you are out running, and you look at someone's back running, all those spinal bones are actually moving in a synchronistic pattern, dissipating the forces so we don't injure ourselves. But if we're lifting heavy objects, we actually need that spine to stiffen up. The brain does this. It does this by looking at all the different layers of muscles. So the deep layers, and Paul talked about this, those little deep paraspinal muscles, that's the intersegmental ones, that's how the brain knows what's going on at that intersegmental level. And he also pointed out, and so did Bernadette, and I think even Kamal, that if the brain doesn't know what's going on in a certain part of the body, how the hell can it control it properly? Are you with me? That's why I harp on about the importance of those little paraspinal muscles, and that that probably is the mechanisms of what a subluxation does to the brain, and the mechanisms of our chiropractic care probably impacts the movement patterns, and therefore the communication of those little paraspinal muscles. So Paul talked about the importance of, of the brain knowing what's going on with these little uh, paraspinal muscles, but then the brain has to coordinate these layers upon layers upon layers, I'm pointing in the wrong direction, layers upon layers upon layers of muscle tissue and fascia, and everything else that goes along with it. It also has to coordinate our breathing, our diaphragm is attached to the spine, and our pelvic floor muscles are an important part of our core and attached to the spine. So not only does the brain have to coordinate all of these movement patterns in all of these layers of muscles and fascia, but it also needs to coordinate our breathing and our continence, all in one go. It's an incredibly complex system. It can achieve these things with many different strategies. The brain has these um, so-called, I'll get back to eyeball there, so-called feed-forward or anticipatory uh, motor programs or movement programs. So for example, if you're lifting an arm up, the brain will decide for you that I need to switch on my core abdominal muscles so that when I lift my arm up, I don't go flying backwards and, ba and basically mini whiplash my low back. It has all of these different strategies and plans in place with all of these different layers of muscles in coordination with our, you know, our breathing and our continent muscles and our eyeball muscles. Our spine is intimately connected to our eyeball muscles. The only reason that you can still read while you're moving your head around is because of those little muscles in the spine acting like little accelerometers. 
A bit like our iPhone. You can move your iPhone around and it will turn. It knows that you're moving it, yeah? But our little paraspinal muscles are way faster than that. And they communicate with our little eyeball muscles to make sure that your eyes stay level so that you can still see your environment. We're designed that way to be able to, to survive in our environment. And all of this is an incredibly complex system. And, and the, the, the communication between these little muscles is really, really key to being able to do that. Really key to being able to do that. He also talked a lot about uh, pain. Because right down the other end of the spectrum, when people are broken, so you've got healthy spines and you've got fully broken spines or dysfunctional spines. It's not really black and white, is it, guys? It really is like a Fifty Shades of Grey, and it's, you know, not that sexy book, although I like bringing it up. You guys are half asleep still, aren't you? Okay. So, so it's not black and white. So Paul talked about the healthy side, and he talked about the things that have gone wrong when someone is in pain. Because pain is something that your brain creates for you. Your brain decides that you need to experience pain because something's not going very well. And he explained all the different things that go wrong with someone in pain. For example, this, these are just some of the examples that he went through. We obviously had four hours to do this before. But some people who have pain, their brains don't really know what's going on in their low backs. Remember what we talked about? If, if the brain doesn't know what's going on, how the hell can it control it? And funnily enough, some people with low back pain don't control their back muscles in an ideal way. Funny that. We also know that the brain and, and some people with low back pain can't Preactivate those core abdominal muscles. Don't switch those core muscles on and off as they should in a protective way. You know, and, and, and other studies have shown that if you can't switch on and on, on and off your muscles appropriately, this can actually predict you having low back injuries. And you've seen those people, right, that have ended up with a low back injury that seemingly came out of the blue? You with me? You know, they may have bent over and picked up a pen or turned and coughed and suddenly they were in agony. It's not all of a sudden. It's like a thousand little straws building up on the camel's back and then it having enough and breaking. And that's where the symptoms come. Does that make sense? And this is, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. There's a lot of ways that the central nervous system or our brains can adapt to what's going on in our environment. And if it gets overloaded, you know, it can adapt in a negative way, in a maladaptive way, that if that isn't restored, you will end up with signs and symptoms, you will end up with conditions and disorders and back pains and injuries. Does that kind of make sense? That's giving it all in a bit of a nutshell. So we don't view the spinal function as totally healthy or pathological. It's not black and white, it's 50 shades of gray. You go a certain way along that, you hit this green line, and that's where symptoms start to appear. You go further along, you now fit into some disease category where you, know, you now have a pathology. That could be a disc herniation, that could be a spinal arthropathy, that could be chronic pain. Does that make sense? So that's kind of the continuum as we see it. So you can develop in a maladaptive plastic direction. So if your system is overloaded and overloaded and overloaded, you will compensate. And that can be emotional factors, that can be chemical factors, that can be structural factors. It can be injuries, it can be microtraumas, it can be you know, the way you talk to yourself, it can be the way you might belittle yourself. All of these factors can influence you in a negative, maladaptive way, where the brain will adapt. What we reckon is that when we adjust subluxations, which obviously can happen at any level along this continuum, as we know, we reckon that we have, for the most part, if we're doing our job right, a positive neural plastic effect and pushing them in back into the other direction. Make sense? And this is now the research that the rest of the team started to talk about. But Bernadette Murphy, so Paul talked about the either extremes, and Bernadette Murphy talked about what happens in people that are only just starting to develop symptoms. So this is a real specific category in the literature called the subclinical pain category. And this is people that have started to develop pains and problems, but it's not always there. So they're going in and out of having symptoms, but they have a history of issues. But the most important factor is that on the day that we have studied them, they have no symptoms. They have no pain. So the only difference between that healthy group and that subclinical group is that the subclinical group has a history of recurring issues with their spine, pain, ache, or tension. Interesting? So I'll give you a little summary of the research that um, Bernadette Murphy has been very, very influential in, in carrying out. We've done some of that in New Zealand, but most of it's been done in her lab in Canada. So what we found is that these people with the subclinical category, so the only difference, because on the day they're all pain-free, the only difference is that one group has a history 
of spinal problems that comes and, comes and goes, their brains work differently. Their brains are less accurately aware of where your arms and legs are. Their brains are slower at mentally rotating objects in space, so it, it's harder for them to identify objects. Their brains, get this, cannot as fast and accurately process sound and visual information at the same time. A history of spinal dysfunction, even though they're pain-free, they cannot accurately interpret sound and visual information at the same time. Incredible, incredible. And they're less aware of where their arms and legs are. So to try and put that into perspective, I always try and give now this car example. Just imagine, imagine you're driving a car. You know, do you think it's important? You're driving a car, say, 100 kilometers per hour. You'll have to calculate the miles from that. But all the equivalent, 100 miles per hour, you're driving the car. Do you think it might be important for you, for your brain to know what's going on in your arms and legs? Do you think it might be important for you to be able to accurately identify objects in your surroundings? Do you think it might be important to you to accurately interpret your sound and visual information that you're receiving while you're driving that car at 100 miles per hour as fast as possible? Do you think that could impact what you're doing? That's what this might mean. Have we done the study yet? Will we have shown that we have less car accidents when we are not subluxated? No. But obviously, that's a study that we now should do. Are you with me? Take another example. Think of a child that you know at school, five or six years old. Do you think it might matter to that child's progression through school, their self-esteem, their self-worth, if they are able to catch a ball, if they can kick a ball without missing it, if they can walk 10 meters without stumbling over their own feet? Do you think it might matter to them that they can accurately interpret what they hear and what they see? That their eyeball muscles can function properly and read so that they can write? Are you with me? Do you think it might impact them and their, and their futures if these things aren't working appropriately? Imagine if that's coming from spinal dysfunction, just a history of spinal dysfunction. And I know many of you chiropractors who've been in practice for many years, you would have already seen this, right? I used to almost itch if I saw a child stumble over their own feet. Like my hands would just literally just start reaching out and I want to get my hands on that kid. I didn't even give my brothers a choice. My nephews and nieces got checked and adjusted well before that I was ever asked to do so. <laughs> if you know what I mean. You know, I, like you, have seen what you can see in practice. I've seen those things. I am a practicing chiropractor. I know I've seen these things. But I think it's so incredibly important that we also document these things. We don't have any studies that show kids should, should really uh, see chiropractors. There's not, a lot of, there's not a lot of research out there that shows that there is some beneficial effects. There's a couple of, a couple of clinical trials on colic, you know. There's, uh, you know, one study that shows that 25% of the kids in that study who had bedwetting improved. But this is not a lot of evidence. You with me? And to me, it's just, it's, just, it's just disgraceful that we've been going for so long and we do not have any evidence yet that we benefit children. It's incredible, isn't it? But only we can make that difference. So I'm going to race, race further. So we then had Kelly Holt beautifully, elegantly uh, presented uh, some of the sensory vote potential studies. He, these are the little things that he called squiggles, which I see in my sleep still to this day. Uh, and, he, and he basically talked about these studies that we've done multiple times showing that one of these squiggles changed. And this particular squiggle, we ended up in Denmark in a hospital setting, and this particular squiggle, we've identified now with these bioengineers that were not chiropractors, they've identified that this, the source of, of that change that we've, multi, we've seen four times in research studies is most likely happening at the prefrontal cortex. That's incredible. That prefrontal cortex is that part of your brain that monitors all your sensory input. It takes into account your past, your memories, your past experiences. It takes into account what it is you want to achieve, what you're expecting will happen. And then it decides for you exactly what information it needs to focus on, what it needs to ignore, and how to get from A to B to C. Unbelievable. That is the part of the brain that we have shown multiple times that we affect the processing of. I would love to jump up and down and say, this proves that we make people smarter. I'd love to jump up and down and say, this proves that you know, we, we can improve people's 
intelligence and memory and, and, and you know, all these things that the prefrontal cortex does. But as a scientist, I can't say those things because we haven't yet done those studies. Are you with me? We can say that we changed the processing in the brain when we've adjusted subluxations. We can show we've, we show we changed the processing in the brain, and this is most likely happening at the prefrontal cortex level. But I don't know more than that. Are you with me on that? And so we've got to be so careful with what it is that we say so that we don't embarrass ourselves as a profession. We need to raise the bar. We need to know what it is that we can say and what we can't say and what the difference is. I'll work with the Rubicon group. Are you with me? I'll happily work with all of you guys as well. We, we love this thing called research. I, would, I love to read research articles. My husband tells me off all the time. I've got a stack of research articles beside my bed, and he goes, you can't be working like that. And I go, but that's not work. This isn't my research. This is just fun. <laughs> so, and I know that most of you would probably rather pick your eyeballs out with forks and actually read an entire research article. And I understand that. It, it may not be your cup of tea, but we can help you with understanding the research literature, to knowing what's out there, to knowing what we can say and what we can't say, and, what, and why that is. And I beg you to, to, to raise to the challenge and do so. But anyway, I'm, I'm ranting again. Moving along, now Imran started talking about the TMS studies. It's basically a way of non-invasively activating neural tissue in the brain that synapses onto the upper motor neuron that goes down to the lower motor neuron that activates the muscles that we can record from. And basically what we've shown in multiple studies is that we can change the way the brain sends messages to muscles. We've also used other ways of using this TMS stimuli. We've increased the intensity and you get this S-shaped increase in response in the muscles. So the, the, the bigger the stimuli, the bigger the response until it sort of plateaus out. And then we've looked at pre and post adjusting people. So the dashed line is after we adjusted the upper cervical spine. So we increased the top end of that stimulus response curve. When we looked at the lower limb, and this time I adjusted full spine, we had an entire shift of that stimulus response curve. It means for every level of stimulation that we gave the subjects, we stimulated over the brain, the muscle was giving a bigger response. The entire curve had shifted. And then we looked at a control session. Every single study we've ever done, we have a control session. You have to have a control session. Sometimes we've even shammed them. When we've been to Turkey visiting Professor Kamal Turka, our bioengineer Imran from, you know, Pakistani bioengineer, beautiful man. He becomes Dr. Imran Niazi, chiropractor, for the control sessions. Because in, in Turkey, chi chiropractic doesn't really exist. The crazy thing is, there are at least three ladies in the first study that preferred his care over mine. <laughs> I'm like, you've got to be fucking kidding me. <laughs> but they did. One lady even come back and she was sleeping better from Dr. Imran's sham care. I'm like, I'm like, but, but the beauty of that is we know it's not just a placebo effect. Because the brains of these people, even these three ladies, actually, by the way, we, had to, we started having a chaperone in the room after those three sessions, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Because I can't be in the room, you know, because I, I literally, I would just wet my pants laughing, which kind of gives it away, you know, so it's best if I'm not in the room when Imran's doing his thing. But, <laughs> but yeah, we had to start having a chaperone in the room because we were a bit concerned about what was going on. <laughs> Turns out he just has this wonderfully calming effect on people. But the changes in the brain weren't there. So they were totally convinced that he was doing this fantastic chiropractic technique, and I was just doing a different technique that they didn't like as much as his, um, but there were no changes in the brain when Imran did his thing. No changes in their brains. The changes we're only really seeing when we do the chiropractic thing. And it's a very pragmatic approach, very pragmatic. I literally take my science hat off if I'm the chiropractor, or Kelly, we take our science hats off, and we put our chiropractor hat on, and we tune into that person, and, and like everything else goes away. It's that right brain thing. You know what I'm talking about, right, chiropractors? It's different. Once I've done my thing, I'm happy with what I've done, I'm, I'm satisfied, I take my hat off again, and I step aside, my science hat is back on, and I wouldn't give a shit if I braided that skin until it was bleeding, you know what I mean? I want good data, you know what I mean? But I'm not that person when I'm a chiropractor. Does that make sense? It's almost like split personality. It's, I suppose it's why we have to be half mad, and in my case, completely mad, to even do the kind of work that we do. You guys are definitely asleep, eh? Yeah, okay. Anyway, righty-ho. Another thing that we did, and this is uh, building up to Kamal, is this cortical silent period. 
And this cortical silent period, we find this change in this silence. Now, this is what the scientific community have always believed is an inhibitory phenomena. And there are multiple papers written about this. And this is where Kamal comes in. Here he is in the first time ever in our lab in New Zealand. That's about the state of our lab. That's about the biggest size that it is as well. So here he comes along because he has shown that if you use intramuscular electrodes, here we are in Turkey and there's Imran being a subject. I don't know if you can see this very well, but can you see that there's some fine wires? So there's two surface electrodes and then there's some fine wires that we've stuck inside the muscle. And the fine wire is left inside that muscle. And we can record from single motor units. So what we've done now with Kamal over this seven year backwards and forwards going to Turkey, we've also published about 10 papers in that same time, but this one single study that we've continued working on has literally ended up showing us that that cortical silent period is not inhibitory, it's excitatory. And that is just, it's just fantastic. It's not good enough just to do one study. You might think you have an inhibitory effect and talk about it as being an inhibitory effect when it actually turns out to be an excitatory effect. Do you know what I mean? Imagine if you started to think about those things and apply it in a, in a therapeutic way, you could fuck that up big time. That one woke you up. Excellent. Wonderful. <laughs> so not that, you know, I expect any of you to really get these squiggles on this page, but all I want you to recognize is that you can see that those two are, are the same. And it just shows us that we're looking at the same motor unit pre versus post. And this trace down here is literally showing an increase. If that line goes up, it means it's excitatory. If it had gone down, it would have been inhibitory. Here's a different motor unit. Again, you can see that it's, it's identical, pre and post, chiropractic care. And again, you can see that it's going well above the line after the chiropractic care. It's an excitatory phenomena. Incredible. And, th and this study has taken seven years backwards and forwards. Uh, and, and this is where Imran goes mental because he sees these single motor units in his sleep. <laughs> because this one you can't really automate. You actually have to look at all the traces. And anyway, this was a control, pre and post a control. And again, you can see there isn't really an increase or that there's no facilitation. So we also did uh, a whole host of other studies. We've, we've shown increases in strength in a chiro population by 16% with a major drive from the brain. In an elite, uh, um, elite Olympic taekwondo athlete population, we followed it up, and we still found in that elite Olympic athlete population a 6% increase in strength. So then Kamal goes, well, what you're showing is that the drive from the brain to the muscle is increasing. It's not really a spinal cord reflexive thing. We're not seeing big changes at the spinal cord level. This is where Kamal is an absolute expert, a world leading expert. He's saying it's the drive from the muscle. You now got to go to a population that have lost their ability to cortically control their muscles, like a stroke population. Of course, you can imagine my reaction to that, but I don't have time to tell you about it. <laughs> but needless to say, we had multiple discussions about the fact that we do not cause strokes. You know, and we then went on and were able to do this study in Pakistan. Um, the team went over and they did this study in chronic stroke victims. Again, a single session of chiropractic care, exactly the same setup, testing the spinal cord reflexes, the drive from the brain, and the muscle strength. And in this chronic stroke population, there was an average of 65% increase in strength, on average. Huge variation, but some of them way more. Incredible finding. The power and the potential of what it is that we do is, it's incredible. But we still need to understand what this means. You know, yes, we've made this change in this one single session, but does that have any diddly squat functional impact on these stroke victims? I don't know yet. All I know is that in this one single session, I don't even know how long that lasted. What if it's gone in half an hour? You know, we can, you know yes, we're going to you know, jump up and down and celebrate when we actually publish that paper, but there's so much more we need to now look at before we can actually say something with substance. So I've got to wrap up. I've, as per usual, gone well over time. This, this neural plasticity model, it's, it's really talking about that spinal function is obviously impacting the way the brain processes and interprets what's going on in the body and the environment around it. And this, of course, is influencing its function on many, many levels. And this, again, will impact the spinal function. So this is a loop. It's a, it's a continuous loop that's happening all the time. Whether you're heading in the maladaptive direction or you're heading in the adaptive direction, the positive direction, that depends on what's going on for you. The overload that you have emotionally, chemically, structurally, the chiropractic care, other interventions, exercise, nutrition, all these factors influence whether you're heading down the maladaptive route or whether you're heading in the adaptive route. But we certainly seem to have an impact 
on that adaptive, positive direction. And that's really cool. And I really take my hat off to the Rubicon group itself for putting together the, the model that they have. It was very brave of them to put a stake in the ground and say that according to the latest research, we currently define a subluxation as being a central segmental motor control problem that has this maladaptive effect on the, on the neural plasticity within, within the central nervous system. I mean, that takes balls too, because there's a lot of people in our profession that didn't like that, because there are many models out there. But the, the aim of the game was, what model has any scientific backing and validity behind it? So that we don't continue to spout shit that isn't true. And the only way we're going to get anywhere with creating our model and building that model is if we actually make it a strategic priority for our profession that research takes place. So if there are people that are leaders in our profession, leaders of our tertiary, ed our, our educational institutions, board of trustees that have strategic direction influence, if, if any of you are part of foundations, you know, it is up to people like you to make this a strategic priority for your institutions, your foundations, your associations. We will do as much as we physically possibly can with the money we have available. But believe you me, that is very, it's a tiny amount. It's heartbreaking at times. So it's up to us collectively to look at ourselves. What priority do we place on research? What priority do you place on research? Is it just something that's cool to hear about when you go to a conference? Or do you do something about it? Do you support research in any way, shape, or form? And that's a question that I'd love to leave you with. But I'm actually going to leave you on a positive note. I would have liked to have left you there. <laughs> but that's a little bit mean, and I don't take controversy very well. So I'm going to be a little bit nicer than that. And I'm going to leave you with some one-liners that we definitely, definitely can say. And then I promise I will get off the stage. So what are some of the one-liners that we can say? What can we say beyond a doubt? We can say that beyond a doubt, research shows us that when we adjust the spine, we have a neural plastic effect on the brain. Absolutely, hands down, beyond a doubt, when we adjust the spine, we have a neural plastic effect on the brain. Now, I'm not saying it's a positive thing. I'm not saying it's a negative thing. You hear me? I'm not saying I'm adjusting subluxations. I'm saying adjusting the spine. I'm very carefully choosing my words. That's what we can say based on the research evidence. We can say that research shows us, beyond a doubt, that when we adjust the spine, we make their muscles, we make some muscles able to contract more or stronger. We've seen that in healthy people, in, in stroke victims, in elite athletes. We can definitely say that we can make some muscles contract stronger and that that is likely coming from the brain. We can say that research is showing that adjusting the spine changes the drive from the brain to muscles. That's what that V-wave indicates, that the drive to muscles change. We can say beyond a doubt that when we adjust people, we can improve the way the brain can perceive where our arms and legs are. So spinal function impacts the proprioception of our arms and legs. It actually makes perfect logical sense if you talk to a neuroscientist, but we actually now have evidence to say that that is the case. We can say that when we adjust the spine, some of the research that Bernadette Murphy is doing in Canada is showing that when we adjust the spine, people can move and learn movements differently and better. They can retain uh, a learning experience in a different way. That is pretty incredible. What does that mean? How long does it last? I don't know yet. So again, I'm very carefully choosing my words. And, the, and then we can say that research is showing that when we adjust the spine, the brain can more accurately interpret sound and visual information. That one drives me mental. That is just phenomenal. Isn't that crazy? The spine, we've, we've documented this in Kelly Holt's work. We've shown that these older adults could more accurately interpret sound and visual information. Phenomenal. And the final one that I'll leave you with today is we can also mentally rotate our objects in space faster so that we can identify objects more accurately. That to me is pretty incredible. I was going to show you one of our animations, but I'm going to skip past that. I hope you all got the photo. If not, we will get it to you. And I'm going to say thank you so much for listening to research at the end of this morning. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.